our last class we went over a couple important things that we need to understand to go through metabolism. So let's make sure everybody understands that. Okay? We have the S stands for substrate. That is going to be converted into the P, which is a what? Product. This is representative of a chemical reaction. The butt end of the arrow is what you always start with. The pointy end of the arrow is what you make. Okay? Anytime you have a little side arrow going on, that means those components have to go into this reaction and something is spit out. So to say what's going on with these symbols in words, the S is be being converted into the P. In order for this reaction to occur, you need molecule A to go in. Whatever you do to molecule A, it causes it to turn into molecule B. So basically you have, it's not proper chemical terminology, but you have two substrates, two products. Two things are going in, two things are coming out. The reason that you have some of it on your big arrow is that's the important part of the reaction. The little side arrow is kind of the cofactor, the side reaction that's going on. Okay? In order for most of these chemical reactions to occur at a decent speed, you're going to have an enzyme to catalyze the reaction. So the word catalyze just means helps it go. Okay? And what we're going to see is the substrate, which is what we started with, binds the enzyme, the enzyme changes it, and spits the product out. So enzymes make the reaction go. We're all comfortable with those words, right? Okay. We are going to see ATP and NADH a lot as we go through this. All right. What is ATP? Adenosine triphosphate. This is the energy form of this molecule. When I use that energy, I chop a phosphate off. Okay? That's using the energy. So to make energy, I need two things to join together, ADP and a phosphate. So the reaction can go either direction. If it's in the ATP form, it's energy. If it's in the ADP form, it's not energy. It needs a phosphate to bind to it for it to be energy. Make sense? NADH, you don't really need to know what it stands for, but you need to know what its job is in a cell. If you see an NADH, that means it has an electron on it. It's carrying the electrons around your cell. In order to make an NADH, you need a molecule of NAD to combine with an electron. Okay? So on the left side of the reaction, the NADH, you have an electron. On the right side of the reaction, the NAD, it needs an electron. Okay? Now, sometimes in your textbook, as you read through things, they use the words reduced and oxidized. Those are chemical terms for whether or not it has an electron. I'm, I'm not going to even get into the pathways deep enough that I'm going to use those words. But I just want you to know what they mean because you are going to see them. If something is reduced, it's had an electron added to it. If it's oxidized, it's had an electron taken away. Any of you that are going to take chemistry though, let me give you a tip. Most of your chemistry teachers won't teach you this. If you have H's, it's reduced. The more H's you have on a molecule, the more reduced it is. That's the easy way to do it. Okay? And I made really good grades in organic chemistry. You do a lot of that. All right? So ATP energy, NADH, electron carrier. Let's talk metabolism. Okay? There's two types of me metabolism. There is catabolism and anabolism. We're only going to go over the catabolic processes in here. Catabolism is where you start with something big, make it smaller, and make energy. That's what we're more worried about. Of course, there are times in your cells and in prokaryotic cells where you make something. We have to make DNA, right? We all understand we do that at some point. But we're just not going to go over all those processes where you make something. We're just going to destroy things in here. That's why all of our slides will say 
catabolism. That means breaking it down. This figure from your book right here, this is showing you kind of all the steps put together. As we talk about carbohydrate catabolism, that tells us we're going to be breaking down what? Carbohydrates, what are they? Sugars, starches. Starches are combos of sugar. Okay? So we're going to start with some kind of sugar at the very top. We're just going to kind of start with the generic glucose. Of course, that's not the only sugar you eat, but ultimately it all kind of feeds to there. We're going to start with glucose, break it down by a process called glycolysis. Then we're going to go into this circle cycle called the Krebs cycle. Then from there, we're going to go down something called the electron transport chain. Okay? All three of those processes make up something called cellular respiration. Okay? So on this side, this is respiration. That's the more complex side of it. Obviously, right? it's bigger, it's longer. This is the same exact steps you should have learned at some point in your previous classes. We'll teach them to you again, but these are going to be the ones that should be familiar. Because these three steps, glycolysis, Krebs, and ETC, is exactly what you do in your cells. So you should have heard this before. Okay? On this side of my giant yellow line I drew, this is fermentation. Fermentation occurs in the absence of oxygen. It's an anaerobic process that we're going to go over. Have you seen this before? Probably not. Because can you live without oxygen? No. Your muscles can for a short, short period of time, making lactic acid, and that's sort of fermentation. But this is something that only some microscopic eukaryotes and prokaryotes can do. So this is going to be the part of it that's new to you. Still uses glycolysis, but it's got another step in there we've got to talk about. Okay? We're, you're going to hear me say a lot as we go through all of these steps, what is the overall goal or overall process? Okay? Because I don't really care for you to memorize every single step along the way. I want you to be able to tell me the why is this occurring. Okay? So the overall goal of carbohydrate catabolism is to make energy. That is what you're trying to do. Okay? We're going to make other stuff as we go along, but... Okay. We're going to make other stuff as we go along, but the ultimate goal of this is to make energy. Okay? Oh, it's in my office. I'm sorry. I didn't realize what you were asking me for. I'm slow. Okay. All right. So overall goal, make energy. We're going to make other stuff along the way. For example, we're going to make carbon dioxide along the way. Do we need carbon dioxide? Not really. We do use it in our blood to help monitor pH. We use it for stuff, but we don't really need it. So that's what we call a waste product. Okay? We're going to make water. Yeah, we use it. It goes in our body, but it's not really the overall goal of all of this. Okay? So keep that in mind as we go along. We're, we're trying to make energy. All right, let's break it down into different steps. First step of carbohydrate catabolism is glycolysis. Okay? Now, I put the picture on here that is a very simplistic version. There's actually about six steps between that go on in this giant arrow. But I'm not even going to show you the words because I don't care if you memorize them. That's not the point. All right, so here's what we're going to start with. We're going to start with a sugar, glucose. I'm going to draw you a cheesy chemical structure. Glucose looks like this with a whole bunch of other stuff on it. It's six carbons. Anytime you have a sugar, it's a circular structure of carbons. Okay? That's what glucose looks like. After you're finished with glycolysis, this is what you make. Pyruvic acid, this is what pyruvic acid looks like. So what is different between glucose and pyruvate? We went from six carbons to three carbons. So what did we do to it? We just split it. We broke it in half. Okay? That is all that is really happening that matters in this step. 
So our overall goal of this is to make it smaller. Okay? A lot of times people see this pathway and there, there's some energy coming off of that, right? We all see that. At the pointy end of the arrow, there's a yellow star. But it's very, very little. All six of those steps only makes two molecules of energy. So the purpose of this was not to make that little bit of energy. That's just something that kind of happens as we're moving all the molecules around, getting ready to cut it in half. Okay? Same thing with this NADH. Yeah, we made a little bit, but very, very little. Okay? So overall goal, which I think I went back and redid these slides where it was very specific. The overall goal is just to split that sugar in half and make it smaller. Okay? Sometimes you will see the terminology substrate level phosphorylation. Okay. That sounds horrific. That is the fancy way of saying I took the substrate ADP and made ATP out of it. Okay. So this just goes back to making sure you remember that you're only seeing half of this arrow, right? In order to make that ATP, ADP went into it. So substrate level phosphorylation just is the fancy way of saying, while I was doing all this other stuff, I took a couple ADPs, added a phosphate, and made it ATP. Okay? Substrate level phosphorylation is just kind of a side step that happens as we go through some of these steps. It's not the overall goal of it. Okay? Does that make sense? It's a lot easier than memorizing six steps and having no idea what they're for, right? Just taking something big, we're making it smaller. Because the big thing can't go into the later pathways. We need the smaller one to go into the next step. Okay. There is a set of pathways called the pentose phosphate pathway. We're not going to learn it. What I want you to know about this pathway, does anybody know what the prefix pento or pent means? Five. Okay. We started with how many carbons up here? Six. If it doesn't have six carbons, it can't go through glycolysis. Glycolysis just can't handle something that's made of five carbons. Because can you split five carbons equally in half? No. So anytime you eat a five carbon sugar, it has to go through the pentose phosphate pathway. But ultimately, the pentose phosphate pathway will feed into everything else we're talking about. But we, of course, we just can't learn everything in one class. So we're not going to talk about that pathway. Just want you to understand. That's what you do if you eat a five carbon sugar. To give you an example of a five carbon sugar, um, fructose is a five carbon sugar. Okay? So have you ever heard of high fructose corn syrup? Have you ever eaten that? Yes, you all do. Okay? It's not horrible. Don't believe the news. Okay? It's okay. It's made from corn. It's a sugar. It's fine. Okay? But if you eat that five carbon sugar, it just has to go a separate way to get somewhere. But it will still get to the same ultimate end goal we're getting to. Okay? All right, so that's glycolysis. Step two, from glycolysis, we go to the Krebs cycle. Okay? You may notice if you're trying to follow along in your textbook that this black and white picture at the bottom doesn't look like your textbook. Because, my God, the picture in your textbook is so complicated, I had to look at it for 10 minutes to make sure I could figure it out. You don't need to know all those complicated steps to understand what's happening. So I pulled some pictures in from the internet. Okay, I didn't cite them. You know, don't tell on me. I just pulled some pictures in so we could see the important things going on. Okay? In order to get to the Krebs cycle, we have what they call the preparatory decarboxylation. Sometimes people, I think, just like to hear themselves talk. So they give things a really long name. All right? This preparatory means what? Preparing. So this is the step that gets you ready to go from glycolysis to the Krebs cycle. Decarboxylation means removing a carbon. So here's the simple thing that's going on, and they just make it sound complicated. We have pyruvic acid, right? And we have these little blue circles now representing carbon. Remember that pyruvic acid was three carbons long, right? We just split the six carbon glucose in half. We turn pyruvic acid into acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA has two carbons. Right? So what did we do to it? We took it from three to two. 
we just made it even smaller. That's the whole reason we do that step. We're still just trying to make it smaller so we can go to the next step. Okay. Now something important to point out to you is this right here. If we take the three carbon pyruvic acid and chop a carbon off, we've got to do something with that carbon. We don't want all that extra carbon just floating around in our body. So that is why we make carbon dioxide. And then as humans, what do we do? We exhale the carbon dioxide to get rid of the waste products. A bacteria will also make CO2 waste products, and that CO2 just simply has to diffuse across its plasma membrane and leave the organism. They do the same thing we do. They shine the lungs. Okay? How many of you knew where the CO2 came from that you exhaled? A lot of people don't, because if you take an A&P class, most people don't even really focus on where that CO2 comes from. We just kind of tell you CO2 is your waste product. You've got to get rid of it. Okay? The reason you have CO2 waste products is because we're trying to go through all these steps to make energy. Well, in the process, we had to chop a carbon off. We had to do something with it. So you exhale CO2 just to get rid of those extra carbons you have in your body. All right, so everybody's good with me, right? This first little step is the preparatory. We're getting ready to go from glycolysis to the Krebs cycle. I like to think of this as a little connecting step because you can't go from one to the other without your little connector. It's kind of a bridge step. Okay. What was the overall goal of this step? I guess I wrote it down. We're still just making it smaller, right? We went from three to two. Everybody's good? Because even this really simple picture of the Krebs cycle I found, it kind of looks bad, right? But it's not. We're going to approach it very, very simply. Okay? It tells you that it's a cycle, right? So in order for something to be a circle, what does that tell you? If I start right here, with something and go in a circle, what am I ultimately going to get back to? The same exact thing I started with, right? So to start the Krebs cycle, we have two things. We have acetyl-CoA, acetyl-CoA. Where did that come from? From that bridge step, right? that preparatory step we just talked about. So that's our little two carbons, our acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA combines with something called oxaloacetic acid. Oxaloacetic acid is four carbons in size. Okay? Oxaloacetic acid, a lot of times you'll see it abbreviated OAA. I don't really care if you know that word, to be honest. I just want you to understand what's going on. Okay? So we've got the acetyl-CoA. We made that. From glucose, right? We split the glucose in half, chopped another carbon off. That's where we got the acetyl-CoA from. The oxaloacetic acid is in your cell already, floating around in this Krebs cycle. Okay? Acetyl-CoA combines with oxaloacetic acid, and you, you make something called citric acid. Okay? But again, I don't care if you know the name. What's going to happen if I take something that's four carbons long and combine it with something that is two carbons long? It's going to be how big? Six carbons. Okay? Now, this is a cycle, right? We said what I start with, I have to get back to. Everybody's with me? So if it's six carbons, as I go through this big cycle, I'm ultimately going to need to get to back to four carbons. Okay. So watch what happens, and then we're going to look at the side reaction. As I go through step two, the six carbon molecule becomes a five carbon molecule. Then step three, the five carbon molecule becomes a four carbon molecule. It changes up just a little bit and then changes again and I have oxaloacetic acid. So as I do this, this oxaloacetic acid, I add two to it, get rid of one, get rid of one, back to oxaloacetic acid. It will pick up another acetyl-CoA become six, lose a carbon, lose a carbon, 
become oxaloacetic acid again. Grab another acetyl-CoA. So do you see what we're doing here? We're just working through this cycle over and over again. So do you think the purpose of this is to make oxaloacetic acid? No, that's what I started with, right? That doesn't make any sense. The purpose of this is to get all these little side steps to go on. Because every time I crank that wheel, every time I go through the cycle, I'm making all these little side reactions happen. So let's look at the side reaction. Every time I go through step two, right here, I take an NAD and turn it into NADH. So what did I really do when I made NADH? What did I add to it to make it NADH? I added an electron to it, right? So as I take my six carbon molecule and break it down into a five carbon molecule, I'm stealing electrons from it. And I'm putting the electrons on the NADH. Okay? Go through the next step. As I break down my five carbon molecule into my four carbon molecule, I take an NAD and I turn it into NADH. Again, pulling electrons. Go again. This is FADH does the same thing NADH does. Grabbed another electron. Then I come over here, step five, grabbed another electron. The overall purpose of going through all of these steps is to simply extract electrons. So I'm pulling electrons out of all the molecules going through these steps, and I'm making NADH. But NADH is just the carrier to get my electrons. Okay, so let's look ahead a little bit. What's the next step we're going to call? Electron transport chain. So what do I need to make the electron transport chain work? I need electrons. So the purpose of this is to get my electrons so they can go to the next step. Does that make sense? Okay. Now we, uh, did you have a question? Okay, go ahead. Oh, no, you, you've never heard me say a number, right? Because there's no point in learning exactly how many NADHs or ATPs you make because there's so many, well, if it went this way, it would be a little different. So in biology class, you were probably forced to memorize, you make 32 ATPs for every molecule of glucose. That is not true. We just tell you that because that's the basic way. It, just, it depends on a lot of factors. I don't want you to learn numbers. I don't care. Okay? All right, y'all just don't tell on me. We're not going to learn numbers. All right? So we made electrons. Now notice we did do some substrate level phosphorylation, right? We made a little energy. But we had six steps, excuse me, five steps going on, and we made just this one little bit of ATP. So again, the goal of this was not to make ATP, right? That didn't make any sense. The goal of this was to extract our electrons so they can go to the next step. Does this make sense? Okay. Now, I did not say it, so I should make a point to say it right now, because my mind lives in the prokaryotic world. If this were a eukaryote, once it becomes acetyl-CoA, it goes into the mitochondria, and the Krebs cycle happens in the mitochondria. Okay. But prokaryotes don't have a mitochondria, right? So I don't really worry a whole lot about where this stuff is happening. But because if it's a eukaryote, it's going to happen in the mitochondria. If it's a prokaryote, it's going to happen just on the cell wall right there in the cytoplasm. But it's the same thing happening regardless of where it's going on. Okay. Okay. So far, we have had glycolysis. We took a six carbon molecule and we split it in half. We made it smaller. Then we had the Krebs cycle. Made it a little bit smaller rotated it through a cycle, and pulled electrons out. And that's where we are now. We have got a ton of NADH, and FA, we have a few FADHs. But they're all just carrying our electrons. That's where we are right now. Now we have a step called the electron transport chain. Again, this is not a picture from your textbook. The picture in your textbook is horrific. It tells you every little detail. We don't need every detail to understand what's happening. So let me explain what you're looking at. The little circles with the double lines, that represents a membrane, right? Okay. 
the big oval looking shaped things that are called 1, 3, and 4, those are proteins. If this is a eukaryotic cell, then these proteins are going to be in that inner membrane of the mitochondria. Remember I showed you that last time. Every mitochondria has the little membranes on the inside. If this is a prokaryotic cell, this is just the plasma membrane. And then the cell wall is just right outside of it. Same thing is going to happen regardless of which one. It just happens in different places. All right, so what is going to happen? I'm going to approach it in two steps. Let me show you one thing, and then we're going to kind of add to it. Okay? So here's our NADH. I highlighted the wrong thing, sorry. There's our NADH. It comes along. Where did the NADH come from? Krebs cycle. Okay, everybody keep up where we are. The NADH from the Krebs cycle comes along and it converts back into NAD. In order to convert to NAD, what did NADH have to get rid of? Electron. NADH gives his electron to protein complex number one. Okay? Protein complex number one is called NADH dehydrogenase. You don't know that. Okay? We're just going to call it protein one. But it is a protein that has enzymatic function. It is more complicated. All right, so NADH gave his electron to protein 1. What's his NAD going to do? Float off and go where? Back to the Krebs cycle, grab another electron, bring it back over here. Give that electron away, then he's NAD, goes back to the Krebs cycle, grabs another electron. They're just the little carriers, the little dump trucks, bringing stuff back and forth, bringing supplies back and forth. Okay? All right. Electron is now in protein number one. It hops on this little Q. He's just a little carrier. He goes to number three. He hops on the other little carrier, goes to protein four. Now we're done with him. We spit the electron out. Can electrons float around in your body by themselves? What do you think? No. If they could, why would we need an AD, right? Okay, so this electron right here, it's like a free radical. If you guys have seen the stupid commercials about free radicals are so bad for you, you drink pomegranate or the acai, acai berry, all that junk. Okay? Radicals are bad for you. You don't want charged molecules floating around in your body. So we take something, combine it with this electron, and turn it into a molecule that is perfectly fine for us to have. Humans and anything that can breathe oxygen, we combine the electron with the oxygen, and that turns into water. Okay? So how many of you know why you breathe? The answer is not because you have to. You breathe to get oxygen in. Why do you need oxygen? Because in order to make energy, you need something here at the end of all these cycles to grab that electron. That is why you breathe oxygen. Okay? Most people kind of lose that little detail and just kind of know, I know I need oxygen. You need to understand why and where, all the way at the end of all these steps, to make energy. You need that oxygen to grab your electron, turn into water. Okay. So, do you think we're done? Was the overall goal of this to make water? Of course not, right? We wouldn't go through 15 million steps to make water. It's the most abundant molecule on Earth. We got plenty of that. So there's got to be something else going on, right? So I left a little step out. So let's go back through it again and add that step. As my electron travels from protein 1 to protein 3, this proton is pumped from one side of the membrane to the other. H plus is a proton. And that drives you guys crazy. That's supposed to be an H. Sorry, it's hard to write on this. It still looks bad. That's an H. So why is H plus a proton? You don't really need to know. But if you want to know, hydrogen atoms are just one electron and one proton together. If you take the minus electron away, you're left with the one proton. So it's just written as H plus. If that bothers you, Change it in your notes to proton. I don't care. It means that it just, that's just the chemical symbol for a proton. Okay? 
So let's keep going and see if you can pick up on what's going to happen. As my electron went from 1 to 3, I pumped a proton. As it goes from 3 to 4, I pump another proton. As it hops off of 4 and joins with that oxygen, I pump another proton. Let's say another NADH comes along and gives me another electron. I'm going to pump another proton and another proton and another proton. After I do this a few times, what have I formed? What has happened? I've got a bunch of protons on the top, right? This is called the proton gradient. Did everybody understand what we talked about yesterday when we went over facilitated diffusion, simple diffusion? I've got more molecules of protons on the top of this membrane than I have on the bottom. So which way are they naturally going to want to go? They're going to want to go down. So by moving all these protons to the top, I have formed a gradient. I have made it where these protons want to come back through. Can charged molecules go through the membrane? Not by themselves, right? They need a protein, a facilitator protein. The name of that protein, and you need to know his name, is the ATP synthase. It's written on this slide. Abbreviated ATPase. That is a carrier protein that only lets protons flow through it. It's always open. But because those electrons are jumping, I always have more protons on the top, right? Since I have more protons on the top, they are going to want to flow through my ATPase, right? Does everybody understand that part of it? Protons. It's specific for protons. And since I have more protons on the top, they're going to want to flow through this ATPase down to the bottom. Okay. And once they flow to the bottom, they can be pumped back up again. We're just recycling them. We still have a main energy though, right? Okay. Here's how you make energy. And I'm going to look dumb again, but that's okay. Every time this proton flows through the ATPase, it changes shape. It's still a channel. But it turns. It's actually considered a little motor protein. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate. As one proton flows through, the ATPase turns and picks up an ADP. Another proton flows through. It turns, has a phosphate. Another proton flows through. It turns, puts the ADP and the phosphate together, then turns again. When you add ADP and phosphate together, what do you make? ATP. Now I have my ATP. It, another proton flows through. It turns again, throws out an ATP. Does everybody understand that? In order for it to turn, it just needs protons to flow through it. In order for your engine and your car for things to turn and your little pistons to go, it needs gas to flow through it. It's the same sort of thing, right? In order for a boat propeller to go, it has to have water going through it. Okay? So I'm going to do it again. Protons are flowing through. Turn, grab ADP. Turn, grab phosphate. Turn, put them together, make ATP. Turn, throw ATP away. Does that make sense to everybody? Some people kind of have a hard time visualizing how can a protein turn. Well, it's not just turning. It's actually changing shape. It changes shape so ADP can bind. Then it changes shape so phosphate can bind. Changes shape puts them together. Okay? But it is physically moving as it does all of that. So ultimately, we have finally spit out our ATP. So the overall goal of the electron transport chain was to make energy, not water. Okay, right? Does it make any sense? This is the hardest, or I guess the most complex part of respiration. So I need you to understand it because this exact same thing is in photosynthesis. You don't have to learn 15 million things. You just need to understand one really well so we can use it a bunch. Go ahead, lady. Correct. Correct. The proton never touches the ADP or the phosphate. The proton is the gas that's making the motor turn. 
the motor is making the energy? Okay, very good question. Very important thing to understand. The protons, you just reuse them. Once they flow to the bottom, when you're ready, uh, it'll pop back up at the top because you've got to keep your proton gradient. If your proton gradient goes away, you die. You can't make energy anymore. You've got to have protons. Okay. So please, at this point, tell me, does this make sense? Here's my overall goal. Does this make more sense than it did the first time you probably learned this? That's my goal. A lot of people always come tell me, wow, that made so much more sense. It's because you're not stressed out. It's not because I'm great. I don't think that at all. It's because you're not stressed out trying to memorize every step. You're just looking at the overall picture of what's happening in each part. I took something big. I split it in half. Made it a little smaller. Pulled it through a cycle and got as many electrons out of it as I could. Slid my electrons through this chain to form my gradient. Now that I have my gradient, I've got the gas to power my motor that's going to spit out my ATP. Make sense? Okay. Okay. So now let me ask you this. Humans, we have to have oxygen, right? This is the way we make energy. You can stress your muscles out and they can live for a little while without oxygen, but they eventually have to have it. Do all organisms on Earth have to breathe oxygen? No. So there has to be an alternative. We've been looking at aerobic respiration, the, what you, the way you can do it if you have oxygen. Okay? If I do not have oxygen, can I do the electron transport chain? You can in some weird organisms where they'll replace the oxygen with sulfur. But let's say I don't have anything to pick up that electron. Can I do the electron transport chain? No. Okay. So those organisms that don't have another option, if you take their oxygen away from them, they don't need to do the electron transport chain. So here's the harder question. If I can't do the electron transport chain, do I need to do the Krebs cycle? What was the purpose of the Krebs cycle? To make electrons. If I don't have anywhere for my electrons to go, do I need to make electrons? You don't make them. Do I need to get those electrons? No. I don't have nothing to do with them. Why would I want to store something in my body? I can't do anything with it, right? So when organisms are starved of oxygen, they don't do the electron transport chain or the Krebs cycle. They do what we call fermentation. Okay? Fermentation is a process of making enough energy to survive when you do not have oxygen. If you've got oxygen, you need to do the electron transport chain because that's where you make most of your energy. But if you don't have another option, you do what you can do to survive. Okay? Fermentation involves glycolysis, which is you know, this step at the top, which is what we've been looking at already. We have glucose, which was our well, six carbon is exactly what we saw a while ago. Glucose, six carbons, splitting in half, becoming two molecules of pyruvate. Okay? That's exactly what happened a while ago. As we do glycolysis, we make a little bit of energy, ATP, by substrate level phosphorylation. If you are an organism that can survive without oxygen, then you are living off of just that little bit of energy. Okay? So why not stop there? Why do I need to have another step in fermentation? So let's look at everything that's going on in that glycolysis step. We're making ATP, right? And we're also making a few molecules of the NADH. We pulled some electrons out, right? If I just keep doing this glycolysis series over and over and over again, what would I eventually run out of? If I just do this first part over and over and over again, what am I going to run out of? Glucose. Okay, what if I keep eating and keep doing the steps? Could I still run out of something? What else, do you, what else goes into the reaction? Remember the butt end of the arrow, right? In order for this reaction to go, I need glucose. 
but I can keep eating. I can keep getting glucose. I need ADP to make my ATP, right? Am I going to run out of ADP? Probably not, because I'll just use the energy, and it'll come back as ADP. Could I run out of NAD? I can. Why? Do I have anywhere for that NADH to go? Am I doing the electron transport chain? No. So if I just keep doing glycolysis over and over and over again, I will eventually run out of NAD. The only reason there's another step in fermentation is to make NAD. Okay? So as I go through the next step, this is your really important part right here. Okay? The second step of fermentation converts NADH into NAD. Where is that NAD going to go? It's going to float back up here so that you can use it again in glycolysis. This is a hard thing for some people to understand, so we're going to do it again. Okay? Glycolysis made it smaller, made a little bit of energy to survive on. Okay? If I keep doing glucose into pyruvate, glucose into pyruvate, if I keep doing this over and over and over again, I will eventually run out of NAD. So organisms that are doing fermentation convert pyruvate into something else. As they do the second step, we use the NADH, turn it back into NAD, and that NAD can hop up here. Let me draw you another line. This is the same NADH right here. They're just cycling through, so you never run out of what you need to make the first reaction go. Does that make sense? That's the hard, it's, it's not obvious usually. You usually have to think about it a little bit. Look at the two protons. Right here? Oh, don't worry about it. They come from another step. The only reason, and the reason I can't point it out to you is because I left a lot of stuff off. This picture is not showing you everything. Okay. So you're not learning every step of this pathway, but you should be familiar with some of the common end products of that second and third step of fermentation. Okay. Some of the common things we see made are lactic acid. That's a product of fermentation. Ethanol, very common product of fermentation. Pretty much all alcohols can be made this way. Okay? So let me put this in real life perspective. That usually makes it a little more interesting to you. Okay? Your muscles, if you work them out so hard that you starve them of oxygen, they'll keep working for a little bit under anaerobic conditions. Your muscles will do glycolysis and then another step they'll make lactic acid. Okay? Have you ever worked out and been sore the next day? Mm -hmm. You're sore because you pushed your muscles to the point that you starved them of oxygen. So they had to live. They didn't want to die. So they started making lactic acid. The lactic acid built up in your muscles is what makes them sore. Best way to get rid of soreness is to do what? Work out again. Not because it destroys the lactic acid. A lot of people think it does. It doesn't. It just moves the muscles to force that lactic acid out of your muscle into your bloodstream so you can get rid of it. Okay? That's the only type of fermentation humans can do. A lot of our little prokaryotic guys and our yeast, which are eukaryotic, they do alcohol fermentation. So if you've ever drank liquor in your life, you have utilized this. The, anybody can make wine. Okay? All you need to make wine is fruit and yeast. You take the fruit because it has sugar in it. You take sugar and water and you dump in the microorganism. That microorganism will take the sugar you gave it. You've got to seal it good. You've got to take the oxygen away from it. Once you seal it, that little guy is going to start eating the glucose. He's just trying to live. 
He's not, he didn't make an agreement with you that he was going to make you some wine, all right? He's just trying to survive. He starts eating the glucose, the sugar you gave him in the fruit, trying to live. The only way he can do it is by fermentation. So they produce so much alcohol until they eventually kill themselves by the high concentration of alcohol they make. So when you drink wine, you're not drinking live organisms. They're dead. They're still in there. But if you've ever seen homemade wine, it's usually chunky. Have you ever seen that? It's got like a clump of stuff at the bottom. That's the remnants of the broken down fruit and dead yeast usually. Okay. It sounds gross when you think of it that way, but you don't care at the time. All right. <laughs> if you've ever eaten bread, you make the bread by doing this. The CO2 that's made as a byproduct is what makes your bread rise as the yeast are growing and doing fermentation. Bread doesn't taste like alcohol because when you cook your bread, you heat it, and the ethanol that was made evaporates out. That's why your bread doesn't taste like alcohol. But some breads do kind of have certain flavors to them. If you've ever had like beer batter rolls and things like biscuits, you'll taste that little bit of alcohol, and that's just how they're made. They've got a little bit of the alcohol in it. Not enough that you would feel the effects of it, but there is a little bit in there. Okay? So are we good? Let me ask you a few common questions, see if you can see if you're good. So what, is the, what circumstances must, do you have to have for fermentation to occur? Lack of oxygen. You have to take the oxygen away for fermentation to occur. Okay? The first part of fermentation is exactly the same as respiration. Why do you need the rest of the fermentation, steps two and three? to regenerate your NAD, to regenerate your stuff you need to go into the first reaction. Okay? That, that's how in depth I want you to understand this. Are we good? Here's my challenge to you. Go home, get you a piece of blank paper, see if you can draw glycolysis, Krebs, and ETC. Just to see if you can follow how it goes, and then write down the overall purpose of each step. If you can do that, you understand. Okay? That's my challenge to you. All right. So how many of you think that photosynthesis is going to be way harder than what we just talked about? Good. That's kind of a myth that you guys have. And I think the reason students generally come to me with the idea that photosynthesis is horrible is because when you take biology class, you spend a month and a half learning what we just went over in 30 minutes, and you are just wore out and you think, my God, I don't want to look at another pathway. So you just don't really want to learn photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is much easier than the cellular respiration we just went over. Okay? What is the overall goal of photosynthesis? Okay, they need to make energy. Energy is one big thing. What's the other thing? Okay, create oxygen is usually the answer I get. That's not right. You're a human being. That's why that's your answer. It's not a dumb answer, but it's just not the right answer. Okay. Why do humans think that the purpose of photosynthesis is to make oxygen? Because we use it, right? The purpose of photosynthesis is to make energy for the plant and to make sugars, make food for the plant, or any, whatever photosynthetic organism we're talking about. This photosynthetic organism could care less if he makes oxygen for us to breathe. Okay? Oxygen to the photosynthetic organism is like carbon dioxide to us. We exhale carbon dioxide because we made it as a waste product and we need to get rid of it, right? Oxygen is the plant's waste product, and he's just trying to get rid of it. Okay? So somebody along the way was pretty smart to make our waste products usable by something else, and something else's waste products usable by us. Okay? Why does a photosynthetic organism need to make sugar? For food. For any component of their body that they need to put a sugar in. Why don't we do that? 
Because we eat. If we need sugar, we, our brain tells us that the sweet sensation in our mouth needs to be satisfied, and we eat sugar. We're talking about plants, little bacteria that are photosynthetic. They don't have the option to just go eat whenever they feel like it. So they rely on the sunlight to help them make sugar. So the overall goal, which I can't believe is not written on here, is to make ATP and sugars, food. That is why we're going to go through these steps. Okay. Backtracking, what was the overall goal of, of carbohydrate catabolism? What we just went through talking about. To make energy. Okay, making sure. The way a photosynthetic organism is going to make ATP and food is by using light for energy. Okay. So our first set of reactions are going to be called the light-dependent reactions. They're going to need light. They're going to use the light to make energy. The second set of reactions are called the light-independent reactions or the Calvin-Benson cycle. If any of you are as old as me, you may have learned that photosynthesis has light reactions and dark reactions. Some of you are shaking your head saying, oh yeah, I remember learning that. Even if you're younger than me, you may have learned it that way in high school or junior high. Okay? The light independent reactions are the dark reactions. Some science, a group of scientists somewhere decided we don't need to call it dark reactions anymore because that makes people think it only happens in the dark. Okay? That's not true. It's just the first set requires light. The second part doesn't require light. But it can still happen if it's light outside. Okay, does that make sense? Just trying to explain a connection if any of you are wondering what the dark reactions are. Okay, but it's not proper to call it dark reactions anymore. Now we call it the Calvin-Benson cycle. Okay, the purpose of the Calvin-Benson cycle is to make the sugars. So this should make sense. If we've got two things we're trying to make, we're going to do it in two parts. First part, make energy. Second part, make sugar. All right. Step one, light reactions. Oh, crap, that looks complicated. It's not, all right? I promise, it's not. There's just two different ways that the light reactions can occur. It can be cyclic or non-cyclic. What is the difference between the two? One of them is a cycle. One of them's not. So one of them is going to have the same start and end. The other one will not. Okay. So watch how simple this is. Okay. Here comes the light. The light hits a molecule of chlorophyll. Where's the chlorophyll? In the chloroplast if it's a eukaryote. If it's a prokaryote, they don't have chloroplasts. The chlorophyll is just in the cell. Okay? Why did they make the chlorophyll a green circle? Because it's green. Okay? The plant is green because it's got chlorophyll in it. The green is the part of the plant that is attracts, is, uh, likes the light, that the light is attracted to, interacts with the light. Okay? So the light hits the chlorophyll. The chlorophyll is simply a little baggie of electrons, just a little set of electrons hanging out in the plant. Okay? Light hits the chlorophyll, the electrons get excited. They start shaking and jumping around because the light is hitting them, heating them up, and finally one of them excites and jumps up. When it jumps up, it goes to the electron transport chain. This is exactly the same thing we saw a while ago. What happened in the electron transport chain? The electron jumped from one protein to the next, right? And what happened? Proton went to the other side. Electron jumped to another protein. Proton pops up. Eventually, you get more protons on one side than the other, right? Then what do those protons do? Flow through the ATPase. And what does that ATPase do? Turn around, grab, make those ATPs, right? Okay? It's exactly the same. 
So what did we just make? Energy. This is cyclic. So at the very end, that electron hops right back in that chlorophyll, back to the party where the light's exciting everything, so that another one can jump up and go. Isn't that easy? That's the whole thing. That's a lot simpler than what we just went over, right? It just looks bad, but it's not. Okay? That's what most of your bacteria do. That's the older style because it's the easy way. You, are you ever going to run out of electrons? Nope. You just stick it back in there and use it again, right? Some of our higher level organisms like plants, they do non-cyclic. So here's what happens with non-cyclic. Here comes the light. Hits the chlorophyll. Boom. Electron gets excited. Goes to the next chlorophyll. There's levels. Light hits the chlorophyll. Boom. Electron's excited. Electron goes to the electron transport chain. Electron starts hopping from one protein to the next. Every time that electron hops, protons go up. When you get enough protons at the top, they flow through the ATPase. ATPase turns around, makes ATP. So all that's exactly the same, right? We made energy. Here's what makes it non-cyclic. At the end of the electron transport chain, the electron does not go back to chlorophyll. The electron goes to a carrier protein. That's my phone. That sounds horrible. Okay, I mean, it doesn't matter. I just trying to figure out what it was. All right. It doesn't go back to the chlorophyll. Okay, so remember at the top when the electron was done, it hopped back in the chlorophyll, right? Down here, the electron goes to the electron carrier. What was our electron carrier in our first set of reactions we talked about? NAD, right? This is photosynthesis. So we call it NADP. When you add an electron to NADP, it becomes NADPH. NADPH is now going to be used somewhere else. Does that make sense? Okay. What would eventually happen, though, to our chlorophylls? They're going to run out of electrons. So we've got to have a way to replenish those electrons. Watch how neat this is. The photosynthetic organism takes water. Don't you have to give your plants water? What happens if you don't give them water? They die. They die because their chlorophylls run out of electrons. When you give a plant water, it breaks the water down, uses the electrons, and spits out a waste product of oxygen. This is exactly the opposite of what humans do, right? We combined an electron with oxygen and made water. Pretty neat how we're exact opposite from a plant, right? Some of you are like, not really. It is neat. All right. Some of you have hit the point of information overload, so we're going to stop here. <laughs>